lot of new faces, so I think just so that I have a little bit of a frame of reference, um, how many of you already have telescopes? Oh, all right. What uh, what types of scopes? I don't know. Don't all talk at once, but pick somebody to start. Yes. I wrote it down because I knew you were going to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> and I have no idea, but it was a Celestron Astromaster 114. Okay. I'm not sure exactly what configuration that is, but uh, you'll probably recognize it as we go through all of these. Uh, yes. Okay. I've got a All right. Orion uh, reflector 10 inch. Okay. All right. Well, I've got a Maxi Dog Pasadena. Aha. Good. I'm going to be interested when I get to that part of the discussion. Oh. I've got something. Well, this is not meant to be everything you always wanted to know about telescopes because that would take at least all day. So I'm going to try to compress into the time that I have some basic information on telescopes so that you can kind of make an intelligent decision on maybe what you want to buy if you want to buy or whatever. Um, and also to understand what you're looking through when you go to start parties and such. That was me. Who was that? Oh. <clears throat> so, uh, anyway, this is going to be part history, uh, part technical stuff, part practical stuff. And I'm um, not going to make it terribly complicated, but there will be a little math involved. Don't get scared because it isn't really too terrible. Um, start out with uh, this, all, this all started in about 1608 when uh, two Dutchmen, uh, Hans Lipper Shea and Jacob Metius, each independently invented the telescope. <coughs> now, in that day, it was more like a spyglass, and it was developed for the military, of course, so that armies could spy on the other army and figure out what they were doing. Well, in 1609, Galileo got uh, word of this invention, and he was the first person that we know of to turn it up to the heavens and see what there was. And thus, astronomic, uh, astronomical telescopy, if you want to call it that, was invented. Now, his telescope looked like this. This is a Galilean refractor. The refractor is the original and one of the three types of telescopes that we have, that we have today and we know of, or that we use. Um, it was nothing more than a convex lens on this end and a concave lens as an eyepiece. So it really didn't magnify very well. It uh, was maybe about the power of today's average pair of binoculars. But Galileo was able to see the moons of Jupiter and a few other good things like that and come to the conclusion that, hey, we're not the center of the uh, solar system, the sun is. So that was kind of nifty. Well, as time went on, a fellow by the name of Johannes Kepler um, developed what we call the astronomical telescope. All he did was take the basic Galilean telescope and change the eyepiece over to a convex eyepiece, which is basically is a magnifying eyepiece. Whereas here, the magnification was pretty much done out here, and this was just to enable it to focus to the eye. A little bit of magnification happens here, but then the eyepiece itself magnifies some more. And that's our basis for our modern astronomical telescope today, even. Uh, refractor type, that is. Um, let's see here, yeah. Hey, don't want to get beyond that. Many improvements have been made, and nowadays this is about what our modern refractor looks like. We have our 
main objective lens on this end. And then we have an eyepiece and a focuser down on this end. <clears throat> there are some improvements that were made. Uh, let's see if I've got any dates for those. Nah, not really, but um, the convex lens produced not very good images. Uh, the problem with it is called chromatic aberration. And basically what it means is not all the colors focus at the same point. And that is, I should have taken these off earlier. That is uh, exemplified if you think of this lens as a couple of prisms. Okay, we all know that a prism takes the light and divides it into its colors. Well, if we look at the shape of a convex lens, it's really two prisms stacked on uh, uh, together at the bases. So the colors of light all focus at different points. Well, somebody decided, some uh, nice sharp optician decided that we could correct that and came up with what's called an achromat doublet, which is two lenses, one of them the familiar convex lens, and another one that's usually like a, a concave or maybe a combination of both, depending on how it's figured. But it improved the situation a whole lot by focusing the blue and the red together and uh, giving you a whole lot better focus. And that was pretty good because you know, not only did you get sharp focus, you didn't have color halos around everything except, you know, maybe a little purple or a little yellow halo around, depending on the makeup of these two lenses. Now, I'll come back to another one called Apochromat later, but <clears throat> we need to kind of stay within the history of things, I guess. The next uh, main Oh, I should probably mention with ref the refractors, before the doublet came along, the achromat, the only way to get things as close to in focus as possible, or colors I should say, was to make the tube very long. So you can imagine a little, little four inch refractor lens <clears throat> that's half the length, of, well, I'm exaggerating, but you know, not, not necessarily half the length of a football field, but. They were, they were ridiculously long telescopes, so um, it was nice to have had the development of the achromat because they could make the telescope shorter and more manageable. Well, let's see, long about 1663, a Scottish astronomer by the name of Gregory came up with what he called the Gregorian reflector. So now we get into a telescope where it's all done by mirrors. The Gregorian reflector had a mirror, a main gathering mirror, a large mirror, usually, uh, usually I think about it, either spherical or parabolic, with a big hole in the middle, and then another uh, concave type mirror on the end of the scope that reflected the light back in. So the light path came in, came to this mirror and reflected out the back. It wasn't too bad a telescope, but the problem of it, with it was that the technology of the day wasn't up to making this type of telescope work. The reason for that is that this mirror and this mirror have to be precisely matched in order for it to work. So because of that, the Gregorian scope really never uh, became popular. But a fellow by the name of Isaac Newton in 1672 came up with another design with mirrors, and this is called the Newtonian reflector, which is, I think, still the most popular telescope of the day. Um, it puts the mirror down on this end, reflects the light up to a flat mirror at a 45 degree angle that shoots the light out the side and into the eyepiece. No. 
like this. Whoops. This is a Newtonian reflector. And if you go to a lot of star parties, you'll see a lot of these. <laughs> this is also a Newtonian reflector. You may see a lot more of these than you see of these, because this one's a pretty short tube. So I'm going to get to that pretty quick. But first, I want to uh, kind of get you introduced to the types of telescopes, and then we'll talk about the mechanics of the, the beasts. Well, at the time Newton designed his telescope in France, a fellow that by the name of Laurent Cassegrain developed what was called the Cassegrain Telescope. And that's this one here. Looks a little familiar, but the difference here is instead of having this convex mirror, this one has a bit of a concave mirror. And this mirror didn't have to perfectly match this mirror the way that this did. So the optic opticians of the day could grind these mirrors and this became a real godsend to all astronomy because you could take this design of telescope and really make them big but yet they're compact because instead of the light having only this part to travel, it has three different bounces. And I'm going to get into that a little bit more in depth later, but I just wanted to um, show you the classic Cassegrain. If you've ever looked at the 16-inch uh, telescope at the observatory, that is a standard Cassegrain. Whoop. Push the right button, and it looks kind of like this. I'll get this thing to move. Now it's got a tube that looks like this, and it's got this support for the mirror, and it's open air, and got the main mirror at the end. That type of telescope is a miniature version of the Hubble telescope. It's a miniature version of the 200-inch telescope at Mount Palomar. Those are all Cassegrain designs. So as you can see, that really, really opened up astronomy to larger mirrors and such. Now, <clears throat> for us as amateur astronomers, um, it's pretty hard for us unless we uh, happen to uh, run across a spy satellite mirror and can make a bigger telescope <laughs> um, to come up with a standard Cassegrain design. But So most, uh, most folks in the club who use a Cassegrain style telescope are at most 12 inches in diameter because beyond that they get too heavy to lift. Now, uh, let's see, in we had to wait all the way until 1930 for Bernard Schmidt to come along and, uh, and, talk, and do some correction. And I guess what I should do here is just kind of back up and talk about the difference between refractors and reflectors in terms of what they do to the light that's coming in. Hi there. Hi, sorry. Um, the light path for a refractor comes straight through the telescope with no interruption. And because of that, there's no distortion of the image. What happens with, with a refracting telescope is you get really excellent sharpness of focus on star images and planets and that sort of thing. And also you get a lot of contrast. There's in the area, so you can see detail a lot easier than with other types of telescopes. The reflecting telescopes are nice because the bigger the mirror and the more the light gathering capability. So what that means is that you can really see the really, really dim things. But you do so at a price because if you look, well, let's see, this is probably easier. 
you look here, there's a central obstruction called a mirror. There's also a set of veins that support this mirror, and they break up the light path, and because of that, you don't get a really sharp focus with them on star images and such. Their real main uh, advantage is to pull in the really dim, you know, fuzzy little things that we like to look at, like galaxies and nebulae and things like that, a lot better. <coughs> Uh, although there is an exception to that that I'll get to. But uh, that <clears throat> then uh, is another aberration, and that is uh, common to all reflecting telescopes in one form or another. Um, and I, the name escapes me, but I'll get, I'll get it later. However, back, in, back to 1930, Bernard Schmidt said, well, let's see now. The lens on the end of the refractor makes things really sharp and contrasty. The mirrors, the support structure in the mirror kind of messes that up. What if I put a lens in front of a standard Cassegrain? So he did. He put, what's, uh, he put a uh, lens in front, a corrector plate as he called it. It's called a Fresnel lens. It uh, is the type of lens that's used to focus beams and lighthouses. So that's where the design came from. So he put this corrector plate in front of there to try to make up for some of the problems that a standard uh, reflecting telescope have. And um, this has become very popular. If you go to star parties, you'll see a lot of Schmidt Cassegrains out there. They're a very nice do everything scope. The only thing I can say, and this is my opinion, is that they are not as good as a, they're a lot better than a, a normal reflector, but they're not still not as good as a refractor in terms of sharpness and, and contrast. Okay? Okay, and then we move to 1941 and uh, Dmitry Maksutov, who had another design called a meniscus lens, so this is his correct plate. Actually, I should probably put this back here. In both of these designs, we no longer see the spider. Let's see here if I can get this to come around so you can see it. The spider is missing. That's a Schmidt Cassegrain. All you have then is the central obstruction the mirror. So that improves things too because these veins break up the light path significantly. Whereas the central obstruction is in the middle of the mirror and in a Schmidt or in a Cassegrain, the middle of the mirror has a hole in it anyway. So this the central mirror doesn't mess things up as much as the support structure does. So, thus the Schmidt Cassegrain and the Maksutov Cassegrain. Both the same basic design, just slightly different corrector plate configurations on the ends. <clears throat> I guess, well, that doesn't matter. Okay, now, let's take a look at some of the technical specs for telescopes here. Um, number one, aperture fever, I mean aperture. Aperture <laughs> um, fever. The aperture of the telescope, in other words, how big around is it, determines how much light you can bring, pull in. And, so I say aperture fever because a lot of us, <clears throat> once we get into astronomy, just can't get a big enough telescope to be able to see what we want to see because it's amazing how much uh, difference it makes. However, you can really, really go to go broke doing that. But <laughs> um, there are a couple of limiting things here. 
Um, as you can imagine, doing a doublet pair uh, or making a doublet pair is expensive. Nowadays, we not only have what like, you know, I talked about the achromat, we now have a new version called the apochromat. And what that does is it brings into focus the three primary colors and really gives you a nice sharp and halo free image compared to an achromat. That's done with exotic glasses, sometimes adding another element and special coatings. Well, we're starting to see dollar signs. Ka-ching, ka-ching. It's cheaper to grind a mirror than it is to grind the uh, elements for a refractor for a given size. So, for most of us amateur astronomers, I think 8 inch is probably about as big as we can afford for the most part. Um, in terms of a refractor. Whereas, for the same kind of money, we can buy one big reflector. So, for that reason, I think the, I don't believe the refractor was ever developed over 40 inches in diameter, and that's the, the telescope at Yerkes Observatory in Wisconsin. Um, it just got to be, a, too expensive, and B, you get much bigger with glass and it tends to distort, and then you've lost your sharpness. So, uh, all of the really major astronomical telescopes that the astronomers use now are reflecting type telescopes, and usually a Cassegrain design at this point because of the next thing, the focal ratio which is dependent on the focal length. Um, the focal length of the telescope is from the input to the focus point at the eyepiece, or in front of the eyepiece in this case. So the focal length of a refractor is this. Uh, the focal length of a, I've got to get out of the way here, of a uh, Newtonian is this plus this, and the focal length of this is this plus this. That focal length uh, defines part of what the telescope is. We have a focal ratio, which is the ratio of the diameter to the focal length. And if you want to know what that is, you divide the focal length of the telescope by the aperture. Um, do an easy one here. This is, okay, oh, focal ratio is an F number, so you're going to hear this a lot. I have an F9 telescope. I have an F8 telescope. This is an F4 telescope. It's eight inches in diameter. And the focal length, well, I guess I shouldn't mix my millimeters with my uh, English, but uh, at any rate, it's, it's 200 millimeters in diameter, essentially. And four, let's see, 400, 400 long, no, no, 800 long. So we divide 800 by 200 and we get four. It's an F4 telescope. So, in other words, the focal length is four times the diameter of the mirror. Same thing holds true here. This is an F9 telescope. It's five inch focal length. So, what's nine times five? Anybody? <laughs> That's the focal length. <clears throat> okay. Is this the same terminology in cameras? F4? Yes, exactly. Exactly. And you change the aperture by closing the iris down. In other words, setting an f-stop. Same thing. Okay. Now, the third, and I'm doing these in the order of importance, by the way. 
The third one is what everybody seems to think is the most important, and that's power. Power is a unit of magnification. And magnification ain't always that great a thing. Some of the things you look at up there are pretty, pretty big, so you don't want to magnify them because as you increase the magnification power, um, you decrease the amount of sky you're looking at. And if you decrease it down below, you know, smaller than the whole object, and um, the Andromeda galaxy is a good, a, a good example of that, it's hard to find a telescope that will show you the whole thing. So, most of the time you're going to want to be looking at it with your lowest power. Um, yeah. <clears throat> it's a little bit counterintuitive how this works because the power of the telescope is the um, focal length of the telescope divided by the eyepiece focal length. So, the bigger the eyepiece focal length, the lower the magnification. Okay, so it's upside down of what you might expect. So if I want to go from a low power to a high power, and I've got a 30 millimeter eyepiece, I'm going to want to put in a 10 millimeter eyepiece to raise the power. That's sort of the way that is. Okay, well let's take a quick look at some of these things. I've got these three telescopes arranged here for a reason. All three of these are 8 inch aperture. Uh, Joan, do you recall what the... Uh, F10. F10, okay. And this is an F9, so it's pretty close to an F10. You can see the difference between the Cassegrain design, which compresses everything down because it has an extra reflection, compared to this, uh, almost the same F number in a Newtonian reflector. Now, this is an F4, so it's a lot shorter, but it's still an 8-inch telescope. And to give you another example of an 8-inch telescope, I'm glad Patrick isn't here because if he heard me tell, calling it that, I'd get smacked. <laughs> but <clears throat> the, the big long red one at the observatory, that is also an 8-inch telescope. And that's an F16, I think. I had it written down here somewhere, but I'm not going to bother looking at it. It's 16 point something is the F number of that telescope. So. That's a long focal length. That's also a very nice telescope. Remember, I said with the uh, refractors, <clears throat> the longer the focal length, the less chromatic aberration there is, and that's the uh, reason for that long telescope out there at Spock. Okay. So let's see if. Okay. I don't think I've forgotten anything here in terms of just mainly the basics of telescopes. Um, you'll want to know this because if you decide to go shopping for a telescope, it may factor into your decision. Um, but I will say right now, I've got, uh, I'm going to warn you about just going out and plunking your money down on the counter because you see something you, you think you like. Um, you want to do your homework. You want to look through as many different types of telescopes as you can. And to do that, uh, you can go to all the star parties, all kinds of different scopes to look through. And you can uh, take advantage of the club's loaner program. We've got all three different types of telescopes for loan to members. So. You can try them out yourself, and that's free of charge. So you do that, and as you do that, you also come up with the other thing that you need to know, and that is, what do I like to look at the most? Because that's going to determine what type of a telescope that you, uh, you decide on. And I'm going to go through just a couple pros and cons of each type of telescope here to kind of feed that particular uh, idea. 
Uh, the refractor is the most expensive per inch of aperture. However, it's simple, it's stable, it's the best for lunar, planetary, double stars, uh, clusters because of its sharp focus and, it, and its contrast. Um, the disadvantages are that you really want to have a long focal length so that limits how wide a piece of sky you can look at and uh, you have that little problem of chromatic aberration which nowadays in modern telescopes isn't as bad as it used to be. Okay, the Newtonian reflector, um, it's the lowest cost per inch of aperture of any type of telescope because really there's only one precision, oops, precision ground piece and that's the main mirror. This is just a flat mirror. So, as far as getting the optics, they're less expensive. Um, it excels for faint, fuzzy things, deep sky objects and that stuff. And it's reasonably good for lunar and planetary viewing. Um, disadvantage, again, you have the, uh, the, the degradation of sharpness of focus and contrast because of the central obstruction. The Cassegrain styles are the best all-around, all-purpose design for both it would seem. Again, it's going to depend on what you like to look at. If all you want to look at is faint fuzzy things, then you don't want to incur the expense of a Cassegrain if all you really need is a, a Newtonian. However, if you really want, you know, if, if, you add, if you're just a planetary viewer, a lunar viewer, or you like to go out and chase double stars or stuff like that, that's the way you want to go. However, if you want to do everything, if you like it all, and you can only afford one telescope, then the Schmidt Cassegrain is it. Um, optics are relatively sharp, it's excellent for deep sky stuff. It's very good for lunar planetary uh, stars and that sort of thing. It's compact and it's portable, that's its real big advantage. Um, and it's less expensive than your refractor for a given aperture. Um, I should come back to um, <clears throat> I should come back to power for a minute as well. Um, if you go out and buy a scope like this, yeah, Walmart or something like that, and they say it'll be 900 power, throw it back in their face, because it won't. <clears throat> there is a theoretical maximum power that a telescope can produce, assuming that the optics are perfect and the conditions are perfect. And that is five times the aperture, no, 50 times the aperture in inches. So, this telescope at 8 inches is good for 400 power. That's its max. And this one here, this 5 inch, is only good for 250 power. That's the maximum power or magnification on the scope. So, if you're looking to really magnify things, then you want a bigger aperture. But then you got to look into your wallet and say, well, can I do this? So. It's all kind of a compromise. But the nice thing about it is you've got lots of time, so do your homework, uh, try out a few different designs, as I mentioned before, and uh, do you know, finally decide you'll know what you want, you know what you want to look at, and then you can kind of shop around and see what there is. Okay, well that's telescopes. Now I need to talk about mounts. Um, if you look at each of these telescopes, You'll, the, thing, the things I'm not discussing right now are your finder scopes and things like that. Um, you can button, hold me later if you want to talk about those a little bit. But, um, I think this is the main thing I wanted to cover on telescopes. Now, there's two different kinds of mounts. 
and they are alt azimuth, alt for altitude, and as for azimuth. And <clears throat> this is a classic design. Let's do this. That is a classic alt azimuth mount. Altitude, azimuth. And this is the kind of mount that the early telescopes were put on because it was simple, uh, pretty logical. And it's good for low power visual astronomy because you don't have an expense for tracking devices, things like that. Um, but I say low power because uh, any time you increase the power, as I mentioned before, you decrease the amount of sky you're looking at. And as you know, everything apparently moves from east to west in the sky, which means that whatever you're looking at it with needs to follow it. Um, if you've got a low power eyepiece and you watch an object, you'll see that it drifts out of the field of view, so you've got to move the telescope. Well, this gets really, really worse as you increase magnification. It drives me absolutely up the walls, which is why I don't own a telescope that doesn't have tracking. But that is the uh, Altazimuth mount. Um, this is also an Altazimuth mount. Altitude, azimuth. And this is an invention of a fellow by the name of John Dobson. So therefore it has the, the moniker Dobsonian mount on it. One thing that drives me up the walls is that any telescope that looks like this nowadays is called a Dobsonian telescope. There's no such thing as a Dobsonian telescope. This is a Newtonian telescope and a Dobsonian mount. <laughs> so, uh, if you prefer to call it a Dobsonian scope, all right. <laughs> I just uh, can't quite wrap my head around that one. <clears throat> okay, um, I'm going to get back to tracking with these things a little bit, but first, let me get this out of the way. Talk about another development that was um, necessitated by the fact that astronomers realized that there's more out there than we can see through the eyepiece. But, our eyes can't collect enough photons in order to see all that stuff. But if you put a camera or you know, a film plate or whatever at, at the focus of the telescope and leave it open for a long time, all of a sudden you can see more out there. And uh, the modern, modern type of astronomy that's done today was born at that point when they discovered that the only way we're going to see any of this stuff is to take a picture of it because we can't see it with our eyes. Well, that necessitated being able to track or follow the object. Well, with an alt azimuth mount, there's two motions. There's up and over, up and over, up and over. Well, if you want to get a sharp photograph, that just doesn't cut it. So, <clears throat> somebody by the name, or, oh, I'll take that back. I can't remember the name, but. Back in Germany, some guy decided to take the alt azimuth mount and <clears throat> take one of the axes and tilt it so that it pointed to the north pole, north celestial pole, and then orient the other direction due north. Everything goes around that point, that north celestial pole, so if you point the axis of the mount at the North Celestial Pole, then if I point at something here, 
all I have to do is move one axis of the scope <coughs> to follow it around the sky. At the same time, they had clock movements, type that go tick-tock, tick-tock, of course, no electricity. However, somebody figured out the gearing and made a tracking motor for a mount like this. And all of a sudden, you could do long exposures while the telescope moved to track the object. And that was wonderful. So all of a sudden, all telescopes had that. At least I should say all professional astronomy telescopes had that. Um, there were attempts to try to figure out how to how to do do it with these guys, but nobody could figure out the mechanics of a variable drive because you're moving up, over, but you might not be moving exactly the same amount each time. You might have to go more up, a little over, more up, a little over, and you had to have some sort of a mechanism that could do that. Well, nobody figured it out. Would have been too expensive anyway. However, then, Along came computers, and thanks to computers, it is now possible to motorize a Dobsonian type mount or an Aldazimuth mount of any type. Tell the computer where you are on the planet, latitude and longitude, what's the date, what's the time, show it a couple of images in the sky perhaps, and then your scope will track. It'll automatically do these little motions for you. Like so. So now we have a telescope that not only can I set up the track, but also thanks to the computer, the miniaturization is wonderful. This thing has a library in it, so if you show it where it is, show it a couple of objects in the sky so it knows what it's looking at, then you can go into a menu and pick out what object you want to look at, push a button, and the scope will go to it. In fact, it's really difficult now to find a mount, a new mount like this. This mount only has tracking motor on it. It only has clock drive, I guess I should say. All of the new ones, this one included, have the uh, so-called go-to option. And I have a 12 inch like this, bigger one, and it's motorized and it tracks. And that was wonderful to be able to have a simple mount and be able to track. Uh, let's see. This one looks strange, so I should probably explain to you that this is a, an equatorial mount. That one's called a German equatorial mount. Uh, this one is an equatorial fork mount. It still has its axis pointing at the North Celestial Pole. And then the telescope tracks like so. And then you point it at an object with both axes. Once you get there, it'll follow it around. Question? Yes? When you say it points to the North Pole, that depends on what latitude you're in. Exactly. That's an interesting thing, too, because if you look, there's, like, there's a scale on these, and if you look, it turns out that and you, can, you, can do the, uh, uh, you can do all the geometry and figure this out, too. When you are pointed at the North Celestial Pole, your elevation or altitude in degrees is exactly the same as your latitude. So, in other words, if I go down to Bryce, I'm in a different latitude, so I have to readjust my mount for that. Okay? That makes sense? Okay, good. Now, one little note about this particular type of mount. If you pay attention at the star parties, you will see that most of the Schmidt-Cassegrains that you see 
at the star parties, and most of them are about this big around, are not on equatorial mounts. This thing is laying flat on here, so it's an alt azimuth mount, and they all have computers on. Again, thanks to the computer, we can track with an alt azimuth mount. Okay, I see I'm kind of <coughs> running out of time here, but this is pretty much what I wanted to discuss. Yes, sir. For photography, does the equatorial mount over here on the, the orange scope, does this have a problem with field rotation? No, actually... What, how, what uh, axis is pointed at the North Pole? It's, it's the... Uh, oh, it's through that, that not... This is the axis that's pointed at the North Pole, so okay. it rotates this way. Okay, I, I see. And that's kind of a good, a good thing to bring up because, again, thanks to computers, we can do astrophotography with an alt azimuth mount. Um, with the equatorial mount, the telescope rotates with the object. So, for example, if you've got a, a nice big uh, galaxy edge on, it's going to rotate like this as it goes across the sky. Well, the scope's going to rotate with it, so you can take that long exposure. And that was good for film. However, nowadays we're taking digital photographs thanks to computers. We have alt azimuth mounts that track thanks to computers. Well, with an alt azimuth mount, the scope doesn't rotate. So therefore, the camera does rotate with the object. So you have to do that in software. So you take, and Tony can give you a better idea of this, but my understanding of it is that you take short exposures, multiple exposures, and then you match them up in the computer. So you do your rotation, your field rotation in the computer, not in the telescope. And that just means you limit your exposures to under a minute or so is much more than that, and then you will get smearing on the sub-exposure. Okay, super. Great. Now, I am going to do a quick change here because I wanted to show you one other thing. If I can find it. I suppose it's probably in the back of the room. Do I have another case back there? Yeah, you do. Big No, there's a should be a smaller one too. Two black cases. Oh, let me just take a look. Nope. Okay, I wonder where that went. Oh, there it is. Right in front of my nose. No wonder. Um, one of our speakers was not able to make it. He was supposed to talk on solar observing, so I'm going to just do a very, very quick couple of minutes here. Matt, he's out. Bill, two yes. more minutes. All righty. This probably can be done in that. Maybe. Ah, cut my fingernails. Now I can't get behind this thing. There we go. Now, there are two ways that we like to look at the sun in white light or natural light, whatever you want to call it, and in uh, hydrogen alpha wavelength. Well, for white light, there are a couple of pretty simple ways, and this works. This particular one works very nicely with just about any kind of telescope. You can buy a solar filter. That just simply goes on the end of the telescope. Presto, you have a solar filter. 
works very nicely usually. Or, in this case, if I can swing this around real quickly, this is just a normal, plain old ordinary refractor. And on the end of it, I have what's called a um, oh, geez. Well, Herschel. Huh? Herschel. Herschel wedge. Thank you. Always have trouble with remembering Herschel. Um, you have to dim the sunlight down 99.99 whatever percent in order to be able to look at it without damage to your eyes. So this little guy does that. It looks like a normal star diagonal, but it's not. It has a mirror inside of it, but this mirror is not silvered. So most of the light goes through it, and very little of it gets reflected back up into the eyepiece. And then I have a polarizing filter on the eyepiece that I can use to adjust it to a comfortable place, you know, a comfortable viewing intensity. Um, this particular item can only be used with a refractor that has air separated or you know, air spaced elements. Um, I should mention these come in three different varieties that I know of at any rate. Um, air spaced, glued, or oil separated. Um, the sun is pretty intense, so if you use a glued or an oil separated element in the front, the sun heats it up and messes up your objective. So you want only air spaced elements to use a Herschel wedge. Um, the other popular thing that we love is hydrogen alpha. It's a wavelength of light that I like to describe simply as the wavelength of burning, or a wavelength of burning hydrogen. What it does is it gives you really nice uh, detailed views of what's going on on the surface of the chromosphere, and you can see the little wisps coming off the edges, the uh, prominences and flares and that sort of thing. And this is a dedicated hydrogen alpha filter. It is the Coronado PST, which is pretty popular and your least expensive way of getting into hydrogen alpha solar viewing. Um, there are bigger and more expensive ones, and they take pretty big leaps, like triple the price from what this is to get, a, get the next bigger one. And then Tony can tell you about one that is far superior to the rest of ours, because it is a big dedicated unit that goes on the bottom, right, on the eyepiece end of the uh, refracting telescope, and it also has a pre-filter on the front of it. But uh, that is about all I got to say about solar viewing. Um, just to give you